So Jared, how does scale affect wildcrafting from a restoration perspective? Yeah, um, well, I mean, I think scale, when we're thinking in business terms, mm -hmm. <laughs> right, affects everything. Yeah. Um, and so one of the challenges that um, land stewards, and I'm using that term really broadly, so that encompasses everybody from like the Forest Service and the BLM to small nonprofits like ourselves, um, is recognizing that uh, native plants and plants period have economic value. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I have to imagine that is an evolution that you've seen in the herbal world. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and <clears throat> you know, there are more like squares and normies talking about <laughs> using herbal remedies yeah. than I ever knew of yeah. as a like kid raised by hippies. Sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, yeah, I think that when we introduce those economic factors into those relationships with plants, um, we have to be really careful. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think that there's, um, there are ways to have wild crafting and harvest of native plants and in these habitats that are sensitive and that have all sorts of other pressures mm -hmm. that are affecting them, um, that is responsible. And, um, but it requires cultivating that relationship in a way that isn't like a couple years of book learning about those plants. It's, um, it's years of watching that plant and harvesting just what you need from that plant and seeing how it responds. Um, you know, there are instances where, yeah, you could take a, an entire individual from a patch of 200 inter individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and more than likely that's not gonna have a lasting deleterious effect on that community. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that when we're thinking about <clears throat> harvesting plant materials to be used for products that are going to then be used by a lot of people who don't necessarily have those relationships with those plants, that the amount of care that we put into that first step mm -hmm. of the process, which is you know, knowing the landscapes that we're on, finding that plant, and taking that material from that plant, um, the more care that is put into that process, the, the, the better. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's, there are ways that um, those of us in the conservation community who, you know, might overlap into the herbal community, but, but where this land stewardship work is really our home, um, we have a lot of knowledge and expertise that we, we would love to share <laughs> with folks <laughs> who you. want to be active in these landscapes. <clears throat> um, so, you know, I think that we have dealt with locally, um, observing instances where folks have come through in public lands, the commons, places that are supposed to be for all of us, and taken every single Oregon grape branch that they can find. Right. Um, or even just like removed far greater than half of the aerial parts of an entire patch. Um, and that's really disturbing for us, I think, in the conservation community. In part because we don't have yet relationships with those folks. Mm -hmm. If we knew who th those folks were and we were in um, collaboration with them around their interest in the landscape and, and what's important to them in that landscape, I think that would look a lot different. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there are these systems of like permits and, um, <clears throat> and licenses for harvest. And while the process for getting those can be bureaucratic and challenging and boring, um, it's really an opportunity for collaboration between conservation organizations and folks who 
have a lot of expertise in, in what these plants can be used for. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a way that we can open up the conversation for sharing expertise across those two communities. Um, I think that there's, there's a lot of work and growth that needs to happen in that. Um, and, you know, I think too, in the work that we do in managing invasive species on the landscape, that there are a lot of opportunities to say, hey, do you have interest in this species? Mm -hmm. Right. Because <laughs> this species is one that we have interest in managing in different ways. Are you talking about like similar <laughs> medicinal uses uh, for a more weedy species? Uh, in the herbal world, we call those herbal analogs. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Plant analogs, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I don't have enough herbalism knowledge sure. <laughs> to speak to a lot, but yeah. I know that um, teasel, for one, mm. has medicinal properties. Yeah. Um, and uh, teasel also for us, you know, when we think about the amount of land that we have to do our work on. So for instance, we, we are an organization of eight people. Mm -hmm. That's administrative staff and folks who are on the ground. Um, we steward uh, well, well over, well, we, we steward 2,200 acres just here in the park. Wow. So do the math. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of acres per person. Yeah. <clears throat> and there are only so many hours in the day and so many days in the year. Right. And so in order to care for these landscapes with the resources that we have available to us, um, we have to consider means of doing so that, um, that have been them, of themselves been demonized in a lot of ways. So we use herbicide. Mm. Um, and if you look at a patch of blackberry and Scott's broom that is covering eight acres of land, right. um, I would invite, invite anyone <laughs> to think of another solution that can, um, in a timely way, create the space for other species to exist there. Um, and that is, you know, the caveat on that, of course, is that if everybody did, you know, management activities on 10 invasive species a day, yeah. we'd, we'd have it solved. Right, right. <laughs> it right. would be fine. Yeah. Um, but that's just not the case, and that's not the culture we're currently yeah. living in. And so, um, so, you know, there are species like teasel where herbicide is not the solution. It doesn't yeah. work all that well. Teasel also has uh, leaves that create water cups. It's actually mm, yeah. a, a semi-carnivorous plant. Did not know that. So, wow. um, so insects fall into that water, and then that water helps to increase the nutrients in the soil that teasel lives in. Are you saying the water, the, the, the bugs get trapped in, have some sort of solution that help digest the bug into the plant? To My understanding is that there are some digestive enzymes. Wow, I did not know that. That exist in that water. Wow. Um, and, uh, and, you know, regardless, yeah. that, that just that structure mm -hmm. creates an environment in which nutrients from new places can get into the soil that's mm. there. And teasel being a biennial plant, too, means that Anything that's trapped there is going to fall down in the next year, two years, um, and go to fertilize the new seedlings that might be there. Um, but, you know, our method for working on teasel management is clipping the seed cones, mm -hmm. really trying to sequester those seeds and reduce the seed bank that exists there. Um, and then also digging the roots um, digging out plants, mm -hmm. mechanical removal, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, to uh, keep those plants from going to seed mm -hmm. in the following year. And it was great news to us when we learned that the roots are actually what is valuable mm -hmm. for, for folks. And so, you know, I think that while we look at and work with the challenges of native plants having value economic, cultural, um, personal value, um, that we can really invite in recognizing the values that these invasive species have as well. Um, 
And you know, we live in capitalism. And where there's a market, there's opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, you know, creating a market for more of these invasive species plant materials is a huge opportunity. And it's a, an opportunity to, to benefit the, the commons and these beautiful places that people enjoy so much. And it's an opportunity to benefit folks who want to make their livelihoods in ways that are centered around relationship with plants. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would love to see more of that happening. And I know organizations like ours and many others would invite those relationships. Is this a good point to talk about uh, the Teasel program or how you want to kind of reach out to the herbal community and how they could participate or? Yeah, absolutely. So, so we have, as one of our many, many projects, um, uh, one that we just refer to as our Invasive Species Utilization Project. So we have a relationship with Wildcraft Cider Works. Um, where uh, there are a number of heirloom apple trees that are here, in, particularly in this area of the park, um, and heirloom walnut trees. We also have English hawthorn. Mm -hmm. um, all of those plants have uh, plant materials that are useful in cider making. So uh, there's a liqueur that's made from the walnuts. Um, uh, there's a... Pisgah heirloom cider that is made from apples from the site. Have that. I've um, had that before. Yeah, yeah. it's it's great. Um, <laughs> and then and then uh, the hawthorn palms, the the berries that come off of hawthorn trees, are used in other ciders of theirs. Um, That's so cool. Yeah, it's yeah. and it's just amazing to yeah. get to see those species, which you know. Birds love all those things. Um, the cows that used to roam all over this landscape when this was- The wild cows. Uh, pretty wild. Um, when, when this was a, a homestead and dairy farm, okay. um, they spread those seeds far and wide, um, along with like sweet cherry that has started to grow wild because of that distribution. Um, it's great to be able to sequester those seeds Mm -hmm. make delicious cider out of them, and then keep them from propagating on the landscape. Yeah. Um, and then for Teasel, really that's been, it's been an experimental process. Yeah. You know, again, because we as a conservation organization don't have the expertise in herbal plant materials. Yeah. So, um, you know, we started to establish relationships with like, while crafting wholesalers um, and really like feeling out those relationships for how um, ethical they were necessarily yeah. because recognizing that there is harvest of native plant materials that in our eyes as a conservation organization just isn't happening in ethical ways. Um, we didn't necessarily want to work with folks who were inviting that activity sure. and incentivizing it. Yeah. Right. Um, and so that's, that's been a hurdle. Mm -hmm. um, and then also um, really trying to, like we do in all of our programs, expand the community that we're engaging mm -hmm. for that activity. And so um, last year we had a, a pretty successful experience in working with Looking Glass School, which is Very cool. um, it's an alternative school here in Eugene. A lot of the kids who are engaged there are... Um, Classrooms are challenging. Mm -hmm. And when you can invite them into a classroom that looks like this, <laughs> um, things look a lot different. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and, and additionally, saying, hey, digging up these roots mm -hmm. is really beneficial for the work that we do. Mm -hmm. And um, making this classroom a happier, healthier place. And it's also a source of income. Yeah. Um, so that's been a partnership that we've developed and you know we're continuing to develop and work with um but there's there's a missing piece there mm -hmm. and i think that you know the uh those relationships that are just based in transactions <laughs> are ones that don't have depth and they don't have um they, they aren't informed really by the the uh, work that we do here. Mm -hmm. And so our hope 
and I would love if this is a catalyst for that, is to engage more individuals in the herbalism community to um, work with organizations like ours, mm -hmm. um, to harvest for themselves plant materials that um, are useful to them. And that's a process that you know, we can uh, facilitate through our conservation partners. Um, you know, this park is owned by Lane County mm -hmm. and we are guest stewards here. And um, there's another nonprofit that operates in the park. And so we, you know, we have to operate within a pretty complex web of relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can faci facilitate those, those uh, relationships with herbalists to come out here. Um, be informed about the the priorities we have and the the work that we are doing after you know 32 years of stewarding these landscapes and the knowledge that we have um, gained from that really long-standing relationship with these plants and places um, and yeah just I, I mean, I, I want to have work parties of herbalists out here mm -hmm. where we're just going after a patch of teasel and being able to come back the next year and see that, yeah, there are fewer individuals yeah. and recognizing that that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but then maybe the next year looking at like harvesting blackberry leaves yeah. or, you know, whatever might be of use and valuable and, um, and a way that we can integrate that work in a much broader community context. Um, I think there's a lot of space for, you know, restorative uh, certified herbal products mm -hmm. <laughs> um, where there's, uh, you know, there's an understanding for consumers that those products came to them via a relationship with place and a process that is um, really beneficial for for all of the organisms involved. Have you heard that there's medicinal value in the blackberry root? No. Yeah, so it's a okay. very uh, highly astringent. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, I believe it's kind of known as like good for if you have like diarrhea. Um, sure. But you could put a sign at the end of the driveway that says you pick blackberry root. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's right? a Steven Yeager joke, so. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I love the idea of work parties and um, getting more herbalists involved. I know we still have a couple more points to go over, yeah. so not to sound like I'm wrapping it up, but if people are interested and want to contact you, what's the best way to contact you? Yeah, so um, our website is a great resource. It's bufordpark.org. Um, my direct email is <laughs> volunteer at bufordpark.org. Um, and, you know, I am kind of the one who's coordinating a lot of those efforts. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that those would probably be the best, best two places. Very good.